So um, I think it's, it's a nice opportunity to give uh, a short overview on recent work on TLS. And this is also uh, a nice boundary because the last talk to tomorrow will be um, a talk on Drown. So uh, I will mention Drown here shortly because it fits the big picture. But uh, I think you will get, uh, this is some a little bit older stuff. And, and tomorrow you will hear the latest news about how to break, break TLS. So I, I entitled this talk, Transport Layer Security, the Past and the Future. Why the future? Because it's, it's about, uh, mostly about the new version of TLS, 1.3. So I still don't understand why it's called 1.3. For me, it's a 2.0, because there are so many changes that will be made uh, in the new standard. So just um, a short comparison um, about uh, the, the versions. So, um, as you may know, the TLS standard consists of the handshake protocol where algorithms and keys are negotiated and the record layer where data is encrypted. And everything will change. So, there will nothing will be left unchanged in, in the new standard. Um, the main, one of the main intentions uh, of, for the, of the new standard was to reduce latency. So, um, the old handshake version needs at least two round trip times. So we have two exchanges in, in both directions. Uh, the new handshake will use only 1.5 round trip times. Um, some problematic cipher suite families will be completely eliminated, um, not because of the security issues uh, associated with them, I, I assume, but it's mainly an uh, idea of um, Observation. So we want uh, the designers of TLS 1.3 want to have perfect forward secrecy in the future, so that no uh, military agency can spy on connections that are in the um, in the past. Yeah, in the old standard, only two messages are encrypted. The two finished messages. This has changed. Uh, the designers try to encrypt as many handshake messages as possible, and there is even a zero round trip time version where you can encrypt with the first exchange. So, um, okay, and for, for the old versions, we had to devise uh, an, our own security model, ACCE, to prove, formally prove its security. This will be changed too. It will be a classical authenticated key exchange protocol. So they uh, did, took some input from, from the formal modeling community, um, and many cryptographers are working on, on this new version. And uh, the extensions are um, changed. So there will be no more abbreviated handshake. There will be no more uh, renegotiation. Um, all will be packed into the main handshake with different um, um, versions. Okay. The record layer was in the, the focus of many of the attacks that received much publicity lately. So Poodle, um, Crime, uh, Beast. These were all attacks on the record layer, Lucky 13. So uh, this was a, a reason to change this part because TLS used a very strange construction called MAC, then PAT, then encrypt. And this is the reason why so many attacks succeeded here. This will be changed. This will be changed to PAT, then encrypt, then MAC. And this should um, make uh, away with all these attacks that, you have, uh, that we have uh, learned in the past few years. Uh, RC4 is heavily criticized because of the biases uh, it has. This will also be removed from the record layer, so no more RC4 in TLS 1.3. Okay, so to go a little bit deeper into this comparison, here's a picture of the handshake structure in uh, the old versions and the new version. And as you may see, um, there is one exchange less, so the last uh, message is sent by the client now, not by the server as before. And uh, this also means that um, the key negotiation has to be um, started by the client. So there is a Diffie-Hellman key exchange. In the old version, the server started it. In the new version, um, the client will start it. And this saves 0 0.5 round trip times uh, overall. Uh, what you see here in, in uh, gray, these are the encrypted messages. Um, so formally, as I told you, only the finished messages were encrypted. 
and there was no apparent reason for doing so. It was just an incident. Uh, the protocol would be as secure if they weren't encrypted. In, in the new version, it makes sense. You can hide uh, the server identity and also the client identity if you wish. Um, for example, one interesting case may be you can use uh, TLS with client authentication over Tor. And this will not uh, reveal your identity. Whereas in the, the old version, it would immediately reveal your identity because your client certificate is, would be sent in the clear. So there will be a lot of new privacy features there. Um, and uh, so it's an interesting development that's taking place there. Um, but the, the question is, will we get rid of all um, our problems by just introducing a new version? This is uh, the thing I'm talking about today. And uh, my answer is no. So we will have to take care that we configure the servers correctly. It's not sufficient to say that we want to have uh, TLS 1.3 as our preferred option. We really have to remove old ones to, um, to, be, um, to stay secure. OK, to um, explain this attack, I have to um, go a little bit into uh, detail about one class of attacks that didn't receive it is very old and uh, is a, but very persistent. So we, it, there was no really good patch against it. Uh, Leichenbacher attacks. Um, and I'll try to show you why this, this is, a, is a problem here. And uh, Oracle attacks on the record layer I will mention only very shortly because this is not in the main, uh, the main goal of this talk. Okay, if you have a look at the history of SSL, Yes, it's um, history where there's some gaps where nothing happened in standardization and uh, some uh, activity. So most of the activity was centered around 2006-2008. Two new versions appeared um, and there was no real uh, reason for that because the attacks were st still scarce and um, it was just improvement of the, of the standard. So it's, this was really minor, minor versions, minor updates. Um, but if you look at the, and just to mention, the old versions are still used frequently. And uh, in the case of SSL 2.0, this was really surprising to me uh, when I learned it from, from the Trump uh, paper that this is so heavily used because this is really a version that has known security issues and should be deactivated, should have been deactivated long ago. Um, if you look at the attack history, you can see an exponential increase in attacks. So, but this did happen only um, after 2009. So before that, um, it was uh, more uh, stupid bugs. So the Debian bug was before that, where the, the random number generator was uh, removed from, this, from the source code and certificate uh, verification issues. This is, of course, a standard issue with, with uh, TLS, how to verify certificates correctly. But after that, so after TLS 1.2, uh, all these attacks appeared on the, on the record layer mostly, um, but also um, different attacks and uh, the, the newest attacks I have li listed above. Heartbleed, again, this was an implementation error. It, it hit the most important implementation of TLS. Therefore, it had a great impact, but uh, it's, uh, it's only, it could easily be mitigated. Um, Three shake was a very interesting theoretical attack, I think with less uh, uh, practical impact, but it showed how complex uh, the handshake was. Uh, Poodle, I think one of the strongest attacks to date, didn't receive uh, as much attention as it deserved because it broke uh, TLS completely and could only be mitigated by deactivating uh, SSL 3.0. So we have, two re we have reasons to deactivate SSL 2.0 and 3.0 completely because of Drown and Poodle. Um, yeah, then another Bleichenbacher attack. This was from, from our chair. Uh, I will talk about this later. Um, in 2015, we had Freak, Smack TLS. These uh, problems about the state machine of TLS uh, surfaced and um, Bleichenbacher signing, and this is the thing I want to talk about uh, in the second part of this. And now we have Drown and we uh, are still expecting new, uh, other attacks on TLS because uh, it seems there are uh, infinitely many uh, possi possibilities 
where to attack and how to attack it. Okay, but I want to concentrate on Bleichenbacher attacks because we need these to show that maybe um, TLS 1.3 is not the solution. The only so uh, it's one solution, but we have to do more than just to deactivate it. What is a, a Bleichenbacher attack? So Bleichenbacher attacks only work for TLS RSA. This will be uh, eliminated in TLS 1.3, so apparently this should not be an issue anymore. Um, what I want to show you is that Bleichenbacher attacks are very, very persistent. So they occurred over time and time, again and again and again. And uh, the, the basis for Bleichenbacher attacks is this client key exchange um, message. This is green here. Um, I don't want to go into details, but um, we have a, a padding here that starts with two bytes that are fixed, zero and two. And uh, when after decrypting the message, this padding is checked. And the original Bleichenbacher attack did use the fact that the TLS server um, answered with two different uh, error messages uh, if this check um, was not um, successful. So in this case, uh, client key exchange message is uh, read because now the attacker manipulates this message. He changes something on this message. And uh, as you can easily calculate, um, if this first two bytes are checked on the server side, in roughly uh, one out of two to the 16 cases, this uh, padding will match. So in this case, we will have uh, a different uh, error message. Uh, in most of the cases, uh, this padding will be, be wrong uh, and error message one will be uh, sent back. So then the attacker knows, okay, um, my padding uh, didn't start with the correct byte values. In one out of two to the 16 cases, he gets another error message because um, the attacker doesn't know the premaster secret, so he cannot calculate a correct key. So the client finished messages cannot be verified by the server. So in, in, in that case, it will always fail. Um, so this is error message two. And from each error message two that uh, the attacker receives, he can um, go one step further in the Bleichenbacher attack and can reduce the number of candidates for the plain text contained in, in the original uh, client key exchange message. So this was fixed soon after uh, uh, Daniel Bleichenbacher published his attack, the error messages were unified. So it, they were uh, simply um, the same error message for both cases. Then um, some years later, um, three uh, checkers, check, uh, cryptographers came up with a new uh, version of this attack. Um, they used an, a countermeasure that was uh, integrated into SSL 3.0 against um, version rollbacks attacks to SSL version 2. Um, in uh, this, this padding, there is now a um, version number included. So, and uh, they used the fact that um, they received some, some information from the server whenever the, this, this version number was incorrect or correct. So this was the next step uh, in this, this Bleichenbacher chain. Um, then um, we did some work uh, together with um, Sebastian and, and others fr from the community and we uh, tried to have a look at the timing um, behavior and um, despite all the countermeasures that had been implemented uh, to date, uh, in, in many applications, we could measure a, a timing difference between um, messages that started with the correct two bytes and those that didn't. And this was sufficient to break um, three implementations, two Java, one hardware-based. Uh, it was not sufficient to, to break OpenSSL because there uh, additional measures had been taken uh, to prevent Bleichenbacher attacks. So, and if you... Um, if I want to put this, the drown attack into, um, into this context, I would say, okay, now we have a, another um, example what, what can happen here. Um, and this is the talk you will hear from uh, Sebastian uh, tomorrow. There's even more than these four examples. Uh, if you put together all the Bleichenbacher type attacks that have been published, um, so the, there was a Bleichenbacher attack at Azorex 2012, 
in, in a different context, uh, there were Bleichenbacher attacks on hardware security modules. Um, so it's, it seems that uh, this is a problem that is very hard to mitigate. Um, even if you go to um, what cryptographers always propose to OREP, optimal asymmetric encoding, uh, uh, encryption padding, then uh, you ha may have a, a Manga attack. This is a more um, efficient variant of Bleichenbacher attacks. So it's uh, not something that can easily be mitigated with uh, cryptography alone. You need have to enhance the implementation. Okay, so um, the assumption is for my, my, uh, my uh, thesis that uh, TLS 1.3 will not completely solve the problem, that Bleichenbacher-like attacks may remain a realistic threat in the future. So we may have this problem again and again with all the versions of TLS that support uh, RSA. So it's only a problem for RSA, but we may have this, this, uh, these versions around for a long time. Okay, uh, just as a roundup for the, the attack picture, a short word on the Oracle attacks on the, on the record layer. Why is this, uh, why was this um, possible? Uh, just to name three examples, we have uh, padding oracle. So real padding oracle attack was Poodle, who uh, extended the ideas from, from Vaudenay to the padding used in, and, and Rizzo and Dong to the padding used in, um, in TLS. We have a, a timing uh, oracle in Lucky 13. We have a length oracle in Crime. Uh, why is, is all this possible? So at least uh, for the first uh, two, um, there is maybe the, the reason is this um, Mac, then patch, then encrypt structure of the, of the old record layer. Um, so what does Mac, then patch, then encrypt mean on the uh, server side? So on the server side, we do this the other way around. So um, we first decrypt. And um, the padding oracle attacks described by Vaudenay, they worked for encryption that didn't have a checksum, like a Mac. But here, uh, in this construction, Mac then pad in encrypt, the Mac is somehow uh, made useless because it's the last step that is checked. And it should be the first step. This is the idea in TLS 1.3. So what we do when we decrypt a Mac then pad and encrypt uh, uh, transport layer message, we first decrypt the message. There we expect no errors because uh, after decryption we only expect uh, a randomly looking byte string. So we have no assumption on what is, um, no assumption on the plain text. The only assumption on the plain text we have is that the padding is correct. And this is checked in the second step. And in the second step we may have a source of information because uh, we get some, some padding errors. And if we have, um, this was with Poodle, where um, they induced uh, padding errors and um, were able to um, use these, these padding errors to, to um, compute a uh, plain text byte. And then lastly, the Mac is checked. And this check may occur um, with some time delay, depending on the padding. Um, this was the idea behind Lucky 13 where you can uh, shift um, the Mac position a little bit so that it takes a little bit longer uh, and you can deduce from, from this uh, timing difference something about the plain text. So all this is, is problematic because we have this construction and therefore it will be changed to um, encrypt then pet, uh, pet then encrypt then Mac. Padding must be done before encryption. So what we will do is we will check the um, Mac on the ciphertext and um, all these problems on the record layer will disappear. Okay, so this was the, the old, um, the, the, the past. What about the future? So I would want to start with another short overview on TLS 1.3, so give a little bit more details um, on what is new there. And then um, I will show the uh, backwards compatibility attack we presented at CCS last year um, that uses older versions of TLS to break TLS 1.3. So 
short, short overview. So first of all, one message, the standard is very complex. So we tried to extract the cryptographic essence uh, from, from the standard and put it in, in two um, descriptions. Um, left is the standard handshake and right is the zero round trip time handshake. So it's, um, there's a lot of crypto in, in the new standard. Um, and what is also very complex is the key derivation. So this is still not, fi not finished yet. Um, so there will be um, a key derivation function, a new key derivation function will be used, uh, HKDF. Um, this is a key derivation function proposed by Hugo Krafczyk. Um, and it is, was used uh, in, in text secure and partly in, in IPsec. Um, so it's a, a new construction and the, the whole key structure is, is different. We have now a static uh, secret that may be um, an ephemeral secret in some cases. So also the, the terminology is a little bit confusing. And all these keys are mixed. They are passed through this HKDF function and um, we get a lot more keys. We have uh, keys to compute the finished messages. We have again a master secret like in the old version, but we have uh, different uh, keys exported from that, from the master secret, the, the encryption and integrity keys will be computed. And in addition, resumption secrets and exporter secrets. So we we'll get also keys that you can export from the, from the uh, TLS handshake to other applications and that you can use, for example, for doing JavaScript cryptography or something like that. So, okay, to make it a little bit um, easier to follow what is new, I uh, have a slide here with the three goals that I think are the most uh, important goals that TLS 1.3 wants to achieve. Uh, these goals are perfect forward secrecy, so nobody should be able to decrypt um, exchanges that lie in the past even not a, a government agency that requests the private key of the server, there sh should only be possible to encrypt uh, connections lie in the future. So this is the goal of perfect forward secrecy. Another goal was to reduce round trip time. This was a goal pushed, pushed by Google um, to make everything faster. Um, and another goal that was stated in some slides um, was to uh, give more privacy. But this more privacy is, is really uh, not specified, uh, it's just uh, some argument why to encrypt more messages. So how do we achieve these goals in, in the new handshake? Um, this is the new handshake. Um, the perfect forwardsy is um, achieved by simply eliminating the two cipher suite families, TLS RSA and TLS DH. This is, um, these were the two families that enabled um, uh, spying of, of agencies on, on past uh, traffic and it will be removed. So in, if everyone uses TLS 1.3, it won't be possible anymore to, um, to spy old connections. So this is um, somehow in the, the standard handshake easily achieved. Uh, reduce round tip times. We have um, to make the client start the key exchange. This comes with some complications because in the old version they had time, they had one exchange to agree on all the cryptographic parameters. If the client now starts the key exchange, he does not know which um, group, which mathematical group the server will use to compute the keys. So he has to make some guesses. So this especially means that he may include several key shares in his uh, client key share message. And I try to indicate this with a uh, prime order group and the and elliptic curve group. So we, he will put uh, the same uh, share in, in many different groups in this message and the server can select one. So this is one of the small changes that are, are needed to uh, reduce the round trip time. More privacy, this is of course um, simple. We simply encrypt more. We can do this because uh, the, ser the client now starts the handshake so the server, um, after he selected his uh, Diffie-Hellman share, can, he can compute the key. Uh, he has to send his share unencrypted, but everything after that he can send uh, encrypted. So uh, 
because of the fact that we start the uh, key exchange earlier, we can also encrypt earlier. Okay, this is, um, but not the end of the story. This is, we can encrypt somehow earlier, but um, one of the ideas that uh, were uh, originally implemented by Google in the Quick protocol was the idea to start encrypting immediately. And for doing so, we need, we need something. We need some uh, key of the server that is cached on the client side. Um, this is uh, uh, cached in a client configuration message uh, that was exchanged in some previous handshake. Um, and if, we, if the, the client has uh, such a message cached, he can uh, use the zero round trip time handshake. And here nearly everything is encrypted. So what we have is um, we have two messages that must be sent unencrypted because otherwise uh, decryption will not work on the server side. Um, the client key share must be sent unencrypted, but then um, and also the, the client hello message containing the nonce because this nonce is used for key derivation. Um, and if we don't know it, we cannot derive the key. Then two different keys will be used. Uh, this is uh, the two uh, shades of, of gray that I've used here. The first one is a semi-static key that will be um, computed from this cached uh, server key share and uh, the client key share um, that was um, sent in a second message. Uh, and as you see, the, the client now can uh, send additional data in encrypted form. Especially interesting here is uh, the server name indication extension because this is uh, an in indication that normally violates uh, the, the server privacy. So it doesn't make very much sense if I encrypt the server certificate where the server's identity is, uh, is contained, but then I have to send for, for um, virtual hosting based solutions the identity of the server, its domain name in the SNI extension. So this is something that where the some privacy um, definition that did not really make sense because encrypting the, the certificate makes only sense if also SNI is encrypted. But this can be achieved with this zero round trip time handshake. So if you want to have real pri privacy, what you have to do is you have to visit uh, the server with a normal handshake, uh, get all the, the server configuration messages, store them, and then um, start the next uh, handshake in this zero round trip time mode and then um, an observer cannot see which, uh, to which of the, the virtual servers you are talking. So this is really uh, an increase in privacy. Okay, and uh, yeah, the perfect, I underlined everything there. We, of course, we have reduced the round trip time to zero. We can start immediately with encryption. We have ev more privacy than in the regular handshake because we encrypt more messages. What about the perfect flow secrecy? This is the reason why we don't use the same key for all uh, of the exchange. We change the key after the server key exchange message because this first key doesn't have the perfect forward secrecy property. This first key can still be, um, so an uh, agency could still decrypt the first messages if uh, he requested these semi-static keys from the server. Okay, so this was, um, an overview over the goals that the handshake wants to achieve. Um, additional um, changes in TLS 1.3. The handshake with um, pre-shared keys replaces the abbreviated handshake. So we have some replacements. Um, we have uh, renegotiation uh, will be also be replaced by this uh, by a, another handshake, which may use this resumption secret that is uh, produced in a regular handshake. Um, the new key derivation I shortly showed on, on the slide and of course on the record layer we will have pet then encrypt then mac um, or more condensed mode Galois counter mode uh, which achieves the same goal to uh, counter all these attacks on the record layer. Okay so there's a lot of work being done there's a very active discussion and um, the um, I think the, the, the standardizing body at IETF does a great work in uh, removing all these vulnerabilities, but the question remains, is this still the final word? Get, do we still get rid of all the problems we have if we only introduce a new version? So, and this is where I want to, to um, 
introduce you with a backwards compatibility attack. Um, this is a slide that uh, maybe uh, Sebastian will go into more detail, I have a better statistic on that. This is just from, from the internet. Uh, it shows that um, many versions are supported on, on many servers. Um, the two in red should be deactivated because they are, are real, uh, they are completely broken, but uh, still some servers are running, are running these versions. Um, they are not our goal, so the attack will still work uh, if uh, SSL is completely deactivated in versions 2 and 3. What we need is we had uh, that, that one of the versions uh, 1.0, 1.1 or 1.2 is running with the TLS RSI cipher suite. This is the assumption and we need uh, a Bleichenbacher weakness in some implementation. So uh, currently there are known, no known Bleichenbacher vulnerabilities um, out in the wild, but as I try to motivate, they, they are turn up time uh, from, from time to time, and uh, we may not be sure that we've completely uh, mitigated the problem. So uh, and one surprising thing that I have um, uh, to explain in, in some extra slide is, and it was uh, also surprising to me when, when um, Tibor and Juraj explained it to me, uh, typically, with a Bleichenbacher attack, you try to decrypt something. You send an encrypted message to the TLS server, and uh, with all these, these error messages you get, to try to decrypt it. But uh, RSA has a nice property. Here, decryption and signing are the same op is the same operation. So what we can do, if we have a Bleichenbacher uh, weakness, we can also sign arbitrary messages. So instead of decrypting, we sign them. This was discovered by Jager, Somorowski and Patterson, was published at NDSS 14, I think. Um, and this is the basis of this attack. So we use a Bleichenbacher oracle in a, in a different way. We do not en long encrypt, but we sign messages. So and the uh, scenario is that we have a web server that supports TLS 1.0 or 1.1 or 1.2 for backward compatibility reasons and uh, also serves uh, TLS 1.3. And there is one advanced user, uh, Lisa in this case, she has deactivated all the old uh, versions of TLS in her browser, so her browser will only speak TLS 1.3, nothing else. So he, she has completely made, made sure that nothing will happen with old uh, versions of TLS. So what can our attacker now do? Our attacker will uh, act as a man in the middle um, and he will impersonate the server. So when uh, Lisa starts the connection, he will uh, send all the messages that can be generated without the, the server's secret key. So these are the, the first messages, so he can generate uh, the server hello, the key share, and the certificate. Certificate is public, uh, publicly known. Um, he can send this, uh, he can even encrypt the, the certificate because he can compute uh, the key from the two key shares. What he can't send at the moment is a digital signature on all this. So this is um, the message that he has to send next. This is the um, third verify message. So this is here, uh, he has to generate this message somehow. And here he will use the, the server, and especially he will use the old TLS 1.0 version. He will perform a Bleichenbacher attack against this old version of TLS, and um, what he uh, does, he tries to get a signature on, on uh, he get a signature that he has to put in the third verify message. So he will hash the, the previous messages, will uh, format everything, encode everything in PKCS1 signature, and then he will send this message, uh, modify this message, send it repeatedly to the, to the server, and um, will, from the error messages he receives, or from the timing uh, measurements he receives, will um, compute the signature on the message. So he has to do has to set up uh, many, many um, handshakes with this old version of TLS, but finally he will succeed. 
um, and will be able to compute the signature and then the handshake can be completed and the attacker has successfully impersonated the server. But of course uh, Lisa is not talking to the attacker or not to the server. Um, this is something that URI um, uh, verified ex experimentally. Um, the most difficult problem in the case of TLS is to keep um, the connection alive for long enough. So we, we had implemented an artificial Bleichenbacher Oracle that was very fast on the server side. Um, and um, I think this, um, the, the time uh, a browser kept a TCP connection open was in the, in the um, area of, of minutes. Um, and um, so this Bleichenbacher attack had to succeed within this time frame, otherwise uh, it would be useless because in the next uh, attempt, uh, different uh, random nonces would be used and um, all the attack had to start fresh. Um, this was the main difference to Quick because in Quick uh, we had um, a, a signature that did not, not depend on the nonces but only on, on uh, the message. So for Quick we could take all the time in the world so Quick could be broken completely with this, this attack without any timing constraints. But TLS 1.3 luckily had this, this dependency on, on other messages so that uh, the, the attack is not uh, that um, hard for TLS 1.3. Okay, but I think this is, is the message I, I want to give. Um, we may still break a new version that should be resistant to Bleichenbach attacks uh, if we have an old version running um, on the server. The reason for that is uh, indicated um, uh, right from the server. Typically, we will use the same certificate and the same public key for all these versions. This is a configuration issue. Uh, it could be solved easily if we modify the server software so that for each uh, TLS version we use a different key. Then this attack wouldn't work, also wouldn't work. But it's mostly the case that we use the same key for all versions. So this is um, the problem here. Okay, my last slide, and I'm just in time, I think. I, I think SSL 3.0 and t up to TLS 1.2 were very good protocols. They remained secure for 15 years. So we shouldn't underestimate this. It's easy to criticize things. Uh, people often criticize GSM, A5. It's a bad algorithm because it's broken now, but it lasted for, for several years, and this is the same for TLS. So it's a, it's a good protocol. It lasted for 15 years, but it's time for a new version, and TLS 1.3 will mitigate many problems, especially on the record layer, where we'll see uh, less problems. However, backwards compatibility attacks remain a major security threat, and this is where I, I will uh, put your attention to the last talk tomorrow, where you will see a very uh, dramatic example of backward compatibility attacks, uh, the drown attack, uh, that you all uh, certainly are aware of. And uh, last thing, doesn't have to do anything with my talk, but I think maybe we will have new attacker models, for example, co-location in the cloud, and we will see many new attacks because we have many, we can look deeper into uh, an implementation and extract more information from there. Thank you for your attention.